yeah, without further ado, let me just introduce our first reader. Um, tonight, I'm happy to introduce Stephen Alvarez. Um, Stephen Alvarez is the author of The Codex Mohodicus, winner of the 2016 Fence Modern Poets Prize. Um, his book is a work of neo-baroque Chicana experimentalism written in English, Spanish, and Nahuatl that moves through the colonization of the Americas to the 21st century borderlands. He has also authored the novels in verse, The po Pocho Codex, The Chicano Genome, both published by Editorial Paroxismo, and the chapbooks Tonam, Tonal Matl, El Segundo's Dream Notes, Undocumented Kentucky, and six poems from the Codex Mohodicus. Um, born and raised in Southern Arizona, he currently lives in New York, where he is assistant professor of English at St. John's University. Please give a big welcome to Stephen. coming and, and well, thank you uh, BAM and Wendy Subway and the um, Asian American Writers Workshop. I'm really honored to be here, um, well, because I'm not Asian, number one. Uh, I'm Latino, although I used to live in Alaska and people would ask me, are you Asian? Are you sure? I'm, like, I'm pretty sure. But um, I'm going to read a few poems. Um, first, I think uh, I was asked to speak a little bit about how translation has affected the way I think things and, and maybe even how I think about language. So uh, I grew up a Mexican-American from southern Arizona. My parents, uh, well, my mom was born in, in northern Mexico, and my father was born in southern Arizona. His family came from the state of Sinaloa, and if you're familiar, this guy Chapo Guzman, that's where his family's from. We're not related. Uh, he's the uh, narco, the big narco guy. So uh, that's why we're not related. We, we had to have more money if that was the case. Um, but so my family, my parents grew up uh, speaking English, or excuse me, speaking Spanish, and they learned English in school. My father has stories where teachers used to hit him for speaking Spanish at school. And this was pretty commonplace throughout Southern um, Arizona, New Mexico, Texas, California, anywhere where there was Mexican folks migrating. So when I grew up, their thought was that we want our kids to speak English only, a uh, kind of monolingual frame. Not only that, but also English with an American accent, without any kind of traces of our, our Latin background. So growing up in my own background, uh, my, I could never speak to my grandparents. They spoke Spanish, and they only had a few words in English. I had a few words I carried off in Spanish, and I would say those are the words for family members, for example, abuelos, abuelas, primos, and also the words for food. Those are the words that we kept. So I think that says something about how we preserve culture and sometimes how we, how we lose it. So before I get into my poetry, um, I'm a professor, but my, my research is actually in bilingualism, bilingual education. And a really important term that's uh, come into the fore more recently is a way to get outside of multilingualism, not that there's anything wrong with that, especially in a crowd like this, especially in New York City. Um, but to get the way of thinking of multilinguals being multi-monolinguals, or having a monolingual proficiency across multiple languages. And a different way to think about this is using the prefix trans, to think of people being translingual and also translanguaging. So the other idea is thinking of this as having a single repertoire that moves between and across languages, or language systems, rather. So that's the way I think of my own research, but also my poetry. And my research, though, um, I just moved from Kentucky, back from a year. So when I was there, I was doing a lot of research with Latinos in Kentucky. At first, there are Latinos in Kentucky, <laughs> let me reassure you. Uh, but there was a bilingual after-school club at a bilingual library, a bilingual public library in Kentucky. We don't even have that in New York or California. So that's significant. That also says something about the commitment I mean, Kentucky's got a lot of problems too, but at least the commitment to try to meet immigrant folks halfway and through their home languages. So when I moved to Kentucky, this was shortly after 2012 or Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals happened, the executive order DACA. I'm sure you're all familiar. If you're not, you should read up. It's pretty important. Um, and when that happened, I, I wanted to uh, work with the community to find out what I could do, especially because I, I did become bilingual later on, um, because I wanted to. There was something missing. So uh, I found out there was an after-school club of high school students, all Latinos, who met after school just out of their, organically. They, they formed their own club. And I decided I was going to go and do some writing workshops with them. So the very first workshop, I brought a bunch of these dollar notebooks from the dollar store, those marble notebooks, and some photocopies of, of the work of Eduardo Coral in Spanish and English. And for the students, it blew their minds. They had never saw their languages represented beautifully artistically, but also the stories that they struggled with and the way they could think of their families as well. So that was really beautiful. And then we did some free writing. And I told the students, you can write como quieras, English, Espanol, los dos, como quiera, whatever you want. So they asked me to come back. We kept coming back week after week, and we started making our own books. 
we, we printed our own books through Amazon CreateSpace. Anybody can make a book. So we did our own anthologies, and we gave these out to the bilingual library, middle schools, elementary schools, because being Kentucky, being Latino in Kentucky is relatively a new thing. It happened since about the mid-90s. Around the same time, Mexicanos started arriving in New York City around the mid-90s. So for a lot of these folks, they're first-generation Kentucky Latinos, and their story deserves to be told, and who else should tell that story but the students themselves? So in addition to this, I did some writing workshops and also writing exercises with them. This one was a poem that was written by two students, Ana, who was 15, <coughs> excuse me, and Ernesto, who was 16. And this is a book that just came out, if you're interested, also for sale. Uh, the title is Community Literacies and Confianza. This term confianza translates literally to confidence, but more about a kind of two-way sustained relationship of trust that you develop confianza sometimes by speaking the same language as people who are stigmatized for speaking their language in public. So it's going to be in English and Spanish, and then I'll read over some of the English translations in a second. So they wrote this together, handing it off back and forth, and the poem is titled No Soy Invisible. Ayer la noche escribí un poema, y los latinos eran el tema. Todos somos diferentes, dicen burros, pero somos inteligentes. Picking, packing, and cleaning, seeing my parents' struggle keeps me dreaming. No me digas que no tengo la razón, porque todo lo hago, lo hago con el corazón. I have a choice to make some noise, and that's my choice. Aprendí a mis padres a trabajar duro, pero todo racismo me hace sentir inseguro. Sin embargo, todavía sueño en un futuro. Hablo inglés y español y soy americano. Las personas me miran y me dicen, mexicano. Feeling like I didn't have an opportunity coming to this land gave me the agility to do my best, even though I have so much stress. Overcoming my fear makes me appreciate that I'm here. Estando aquí he aprendido mucho. Y sé que lo puedo lograr si lucho. Quiero dar gracias a todos ustedes por hacer eso posible, por quedarme en este país. No soy invisible. So that was the two students. I'm going to read just the English part if I could. Last night I wrote a poem and, la and the Latinos were the subject. We're all different. Some, of, some call us unintelligent, but we are intelligent. Don't tell me I'm being unreasonable because everything I do, I do with heart. I learned from my parents to work hard but all the racism makes me insecure. However, I still dream of a future. I speak English and Spanish and I am American. People see me and tell me I'm Mexican. Being here, I've learned so much and I know I can achieve success if I fight. I wanna thank you all for making this possible, for reminding me that in this nation, I am not invisible. So really beautiful poems and the students, I think that gave me a lot of insight um, especially because of their lived experience and crossing languages like that. You can hear the music, I think, in the couplets between back and forth. So it was really cool. Um, but now I'm going to read my weird stuff. This is my book. This is, now, we get to, now we get to the weird shit. Okay. Or mierda, como dice en español. <laughs> so um, the name of the book, Codex Mahauticus. And I met like a, I should say, I, I got a PhD. I didn't go through an MFA program. In fact, I was discouraged to write poetry from the very beginning. And I still get those rejection notes. So I mean, things still happen. But um, as it were, um, there's a lot of things that I do that I think happens in MFA programs where they tell you what not to do. So one thing I learned from a pretty famous poet is he says, make sure that your title, uh, people can pronounce it. I'm like, oh, well, I wrote rule number one. <laughs> so this is the Codex Mohaudicus. And the joke kind of behind this is that, well, it's sort of a history. Uh, in the history of the Americas, when Columbus arrived, there was already writing here but it wasn't the kind of alphabetic script that we understand that emerged from Europe. That means when the Europeans came, they assumed that there was no writing here, there was no history, and therefore we must conquer you. Oh, that means we also have to burn your books. Okay, so there was a, a tradition of text that was already here, although only about maybe five or 10 still exists. One of them is the Codex Borbonicus, and they're all in Europe. So the Codex Borbonicus, of course, is in the French royal family. It's in Paris, the bourbon you might recognize. So this is a joke about finding a lost text, but this is the Codex Mohaudicus, although Mohau, if you're not familiar, is a Spanish word for someone as a wetback, pejorative term. So it's, this is the Codex Mohaudicus, but it also has the idea of about what it means to be undocumented and to cross borders, but also how that relates to conquest. So the first um, poem I'm going to read, it's a numbered list that crosses English, Spanish, and a little bit of Nahuatl, which is the language of the Aztecs. Um, for example, the word tomato is Hitomato, which is an Aztec word, aguacuato, avocado as well, and of course the very famous chocolato, chocolate all come from Aztec roots. So this text is called Aztecs and Interpretation. Artifacts. One, vistas of ritual killings. Two, tira de la peregnación. 
Three, new fire ceremony. Four, Mashika feathered headdress and fathers. Five, eagle woman flies upwards. Six, warrior costumes and jewelry. Seven, page from book of days. Eight, face of battle, the brazo of Alvaro Abragon. Nine, bountiful mixed tree. Ten, take it to the Kaxlik de Cato. Eleven, rattlesnake coiled and she. Twelve, Quetlicu's naked snake skirt of stars. Thirteen, relief, Koyox Yankee. 14, Quetzalcoatl and Tepatlipotex. 15, figure Quetzalcoatl. 16, Quetzalcoatl. 17, festival of Ochpacintli. 18, deerskin screenfold. 19, Plazo Teatl giving birth. 20, seated Shipitoltec. 21, red Shipitoltec. 22, pyramid temple. 23, penetrate temple and squaring time. 24, there thou livest. Thou rejoicest among thy true acquaintances. There thou selecteth, taketh possession of, thou inspirest the weeper, the sorrower, the sire, and there thou placed upon them, glorifiest them with the peaked hat, the turquoise diadem, and earplug, lip plug, headband, calf band, necklace, ocelot feather, 25 obsidian knife water, sacred fluid for washing obsidian knives of sacrifice, drunk by those sacrificed, making them careless of, 26, their hitching fates, 27, poetry to make something happen, 28, clay turtle shell drum and several stone turtles, 29, parrot and goose bones, 30, red daylight western region of death, sawfish snout magay thorns, four cakes of copal, flint knives, two stone frogs, painted blue. Yeah, like I said, weird shit. <laughs> but that's fun. Um, I'm going to read one that's a little bit probably easier. I think my, my poetry is very narrative in the way I present oftentimes, um, which I think is good, which I kind of like. Uh, so this is the first poem I ever read in public. And I read it in 2008. There was this contest about writing a poem about Times Square. Uh, by the Poetry Society of America. So typically, I was like, I'll send something in. I wasn't expecting much, but then I won. I was like, whoa. So I had to read my poem in Times Square, where that big-ass TV is. I was right there. So my very first reading was in the middle of Times Square. And I'll tell you, when I read it, of course, it's a really bustling space, but by the very end, and I'll do it here, um, I felt like I silenced everybody, like Manhattan just went quiet. So you'll see what I'm getting at. So, and I should tell you, it's about a character who's trying to find a place to dump his uncle's ashes in Times Square. Yeah, that's pretty good. Okay, so this one is titled, 2008, Fifth Son, Our Present. And so Theo Pancho and Charlie penetrated Manhattan land, deep, sloppy July, humidity tangling them until Times es Square, as Theo used to say, though he'd never been. And so his Sinaloan destiny linked with Webb to this eastern place. And so Charlie Chastateas would dump his Theo's ashes wherever he thought best here in Times es Square. Charlie looked down at his tío's new shell and said, Pero oye, listen, oye, and look, tío, la luz, said Charlie to his tío, whom he toted in black plastic sack, cinched at top and how long and hidden. Theo, in his dreams, followed clinking cloud, rolling curtains, gas green, neon billowing, crowd furrowed, strange brows. Pues, mighty torrent, crowd sure as its might, and comete los huevos, tío, hush your thunder, said Charlie, clearly speaking his tíos de la muertos pancho, shun what's common and mean, 6,982,488 lights flashing fury thought bulbs, and another 6,982,488, and noise, and his tío from beyond, para el tiempo to boot, and these lines, cosmos, black, blanket, Star, speckled nebulae, constellations of suns, lend your orejas that Charlie to the folks exiting planet Hollywood and to some beautiful 50-foot tall pouty-lipped pyrite white being, oh, Theo, away, alone, along on 42, Charlie walking solo west with Theo's ashes in his plastic sack, Wachale, walking Theo's ashes north past Swatch, hug sideways, oh, servicio, here, Theo, here, time's money, Theo, Charlie said to his uncle's ashes, sack cinched, time, a movement in Manhattan land, time, metaphor, said Charlie to his uncle's ashes, time doesn't exist, bueno, buckle no arrow, Bucket no fleeting, ye sense, and Charlie Chastatea is reckoned here in Nueva York, lights, lights and folks who ask C for money and ask, say, B to B, what's in that bag, boss? And can I get some? And see, si, no, es mi tío en esta bolsa. Basta! Y no forever sus primos no tienen su papá. Now, now, no forever, Charlie, and the body just disappears, becomes dirt, 
dirt. Dirt. Well, his ashes anyway. Never to have visited times a square with blood mixed with his flesh. Oh, Theo. Dead. 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 Evil in his politicking. Fascista como Ezra Pound. Racist Theo. Fearful Theo. Hatred. Hard-hearted contra women, immigrants, LGBTQ, all ethnicities. Evil Theo. Of different worlds, really. Refracted big time. And he wanted times a square? No manches! He died from self-hatred, self-pity, self-dread. All these lights. Charlie looked up. Always electric day here in this place. Charlie needed a dark place. And he eyed a green flower pot. Sweat in his eyes. Pot over yonder. And said to the box. There are two things in this dirty, dirty world. Up he looked at groups of students chaperoned by working class folk from wax museum. Snapping plastic selfies. Visible through the window. Two brute. Two things. Brute facts and social facts, Theo. Brute facts exist without us. Charlie is still speaking to cinched bag, but objects in relation to time after lantern yard, loss of Quetzalcoatl, absence of meaning, and Charlie speaking faster, rambling, ravel row, space without time, repetition instead, cyclical time. Hello, Quetzalcoatl, I order you universe, Times square, stop! And nothing, nothing. Look, Theo, here he spoke to the ashes in the box. Shells. So that's my time, everybody. Thank you so much. Thank you, Stephen. That was awesome. <laughs> um, our next reader tonight is um, Jen Hyde. Um, her debut collection is called Hua Shi Hua, um, Drawings and Poems from China, and it's out from Asata Press. Um, and Jen was one of the first Margins Fellows at the Asian American Writers Workshop, um, which, you, if you don't know, it's a fellowship we give out to like emerging writers of poetry, fiction, and like creative nonfiction. Um, and yeah, Jen's like a longtime member of the AAWW family, so I'm really excited to be introducing her. Um, and her book in particular is like one of the most, I think, fascinating uses of like translation I've seen in a poetry collection, and I'm really excited to hear her talk about it. Um, She'll say more, but basically uh, she uses the image of the yellow crane to interpose English translations of classical Chinese poetry with her experience of the contemporary Shanghai skyline. Um, Kimiko Han hailed the collection, a lyrical quest for heritage, for language, and for poetry itself. Um, Jen lives in Brooklyn, where she's the heart valve ambassador for the American Heart Association, um, the assistant poetry editor of the Bellevue Literary Review, and a collaborative chapbook publisher for No Deer slash Small Anchor. Give it up for Jen. Thank you, Sophia, and thank you, Molly. Um, it's such an honor to read with Sahar and Steven, and it's a delight to be here. Um, so thank you, Wendy Subway. Um, I will start with a bilingual poem, and then I'll backtrack a little bit and talk about my process of writing this manuscript. This poem is called Conversation. Um, there's one reading of it in Chinese, and then there are two readings of it, two couplets that are separate in English. Conversation. Hua hua, hua hua. China changes, the flowers say. Speaking Chinese transforms the flowers. So at the end of 2013, I moved to Shanghai. I wanted to teach myself how to read a language of my heritage and to understand my Chinese identity. In Mandarin, I'm called a Huaren, an ethnically Chinese person who was not born in China. In English, I'm a person of the Chinese diaspora by way of my mother, who moved to the United States from Indonesia. As a biracial American poet and book artist, I felt illiterate in the language of my own culture, a language that nevertheless belongs to me. In Shanghai, I audited a book arts class taught by Marianne Pettit at NYU Shanghai, and I assisted with the launch of the university's first student-run news publication. While I experimented with book forms and storytelling, I was learning about free speech in China, a concept more complex than is or can be depicted by English language media. Those complexities shaped the way I began writing about the Shanghai landscape. 
I became invested in depicting the liminal life moments and interactions and stillnesses between me and the people I encountered in the city, and how such encounters enabled me to think about my own family and cultural history. I began to think about freedom of speech as not just the right to discuss, critique, and advocate for a variety of human voices in a political conversation, but also as one's personal right to her own experience. Around this time, I began reading about the small press publishing practices in the Ming Dynasty. At that time, the cities around Shanghai were known for producing prolific poetry and for manufacturing materials, paper, ink, and brushes, to make books. I read that Chinese printing scholar Chao Kaiwing who explained why woodblock printing became a popular and affordable publishing method for small presses in China. Despite Gutenberg's move development of movable type in Europe, woodblock printing remained the most attractive technology for most Chinese printers without substantial resources. Because a carver did not need to be literate, illiterate workers, including women and children, could and did become carvers a book could be produced by one person. From copying the text to the block, printing copies, and finally stitching the pages. In Chow's description, I felt I'd found myself, a maker of books and an illiterate person who was both inside a cultural landscape I'd been born into and outside of the immediate cultural and historical fluency of that language. I transformed Chow's description into a recorded performance of illiterate book publishing in which I played the role of publisher, printer, and illiterate writer. I printed five copies of this manuscript using woodblock plates, a laser cutter, traditional relief printing techniques, and bamboo paper, which I sourced from a paper village in Suzhou. The paper village remains an independent publisher today, though due to copyright and publishing laws in China, it prints only classic texts, and they are beautiful. The poems in this printing of Hua Shihua are an artifact of my performance. Through a process I called generative translation, I interpreted classic Chinese poetry written at the site of the Yellow Crane Tower in Wuhan City, and I used the image of the crane, whose presence is now that of a machine in the Shanghai skyline, to explore the city's landscape and define my own relationship to my mother and our heritage as I moved through it. This method of exploration enabled me to render a range of my own selves in the landscape of my poems. The title of this book draws on four characters that, to the foreign ear, make a similar sound, hua. Yet each of these characters is distinct in writing and distinguished by its tone when spoken aloud. I use them as an organizing principle for this book, and I combine them to write a bilingual poem. When I finished the performance, I realized that perhaps I am not so much an illiterate writer, but one who was unable to fully understand both my first language and the languages of my heritage, and that this is an identity that requires lifelong mining. In Shanghai, I just found the beginning of my work as a poet. And before I begin reading more from the book, I wanted to say too that I may have found my work as a poet in Shanghai, but I found my community at the workshop, and it remains such a special place to me. Um, so the first several poems I'll read are correspondences to poets writing at the site of or to the Yellow Crane Tower in Wuhan City. That was written, um, so the, the tower was constructed um, in 236 AD, I believe, and then it was demolished several times over the course of uh, years and rebuilt. And the newest construction of it was built in 1985. It looks like a classic pagoda from the outside, but the inside is a completely modern building. There's elevators, there's lights, and at the top, there's a poetry studio. And there's a desk, and there's ink, and there's paper and brushes, um, and it's for Chinese poets. So when I learned about this, I thought, well, I've been to the Yellow Crane Tower. I had visited it years ago when I was um, on a cruise going down the Yangtze River. And I didn't know about the poetry room then. When I learned about it, I then learned that you couldn't visit it unless you were Chinese. Um, so these correspondences are my way of visiting it in my dreams. Um, this first 
poem is a generative translation of a poem for the Yellow Crane Tower by Tsui Hao, who's an 8th century poet. He was looking out onto the city and thinking about standing um, at the Crane Tower itself. And so I was thinking about him. And as I was, I was translating, I didn't want to translate the poem exactly. I wanted to build a vocabulary for a new poem that was a correspondence back to him using the words he had used in his poem. So that's why they're correspondences. To Tsui Hao, there are people mounted the yellow crane, but who is freer at the top? The yellow crane has been moving for a while or is already gone by the time my word arrives that white clouds have emptied the air forever. Finally, the clear day appears over a clear crater lake. Hello, Tsui Hao from this world where the tree of life is a fragrant bizarro of your life. Tell me where the sun sets over your mountains. From the crane, I'm saying good night, day, falling over the water. The warrior drops, like Visine, lightening the dust from your eyes. So as I was reading these poems written for the Yellow Crane Tower, I learned that Li Bai read Sui Hao's poem and was so moved by it, wanted to write a poem for Sui Hao, for the Yellow Crane Tower, while simultaneously acknowledging he could never write a poem as good as Sui Hao's. So this is my correspondence to Li Bai, thinking about the inability or impossibility of ever being as great a poet. To Li Bai, look west, Yellow Crane, or a bird I have renamed. You, Li Bai, you blossom, air out of air. I am still chasing a fire with a purpose, whose lonely cry is yellow, over the mountain, then brown, over the mountain, the mountain adrift, the delta an opening, into the blue you prescribed horizons, and I am looking out for a change in the line from flat to tower. Did you ever think of fish when you lifted the river over your face, when the wine spoiled, when the moon too big and yellow grew? And this last poem I'll read from this section um, was uh, written in a correspondence to Zheng Banqiao, who is an 18th century poet from the Jiangsu province, which is near Shanghai. Um, and he wasn't born into a wealthy family, but um, became um, part of the court. And it was through his own writing of shihua and of calligraphy paintings. Um, he became well known for that. And so um, I was really moved by hearing how someone could move from you know, being born in one place in life to another. And Zheng Banqiao is not writing from the site of the Yellow Crane Tower. He's writing from Dongting Lake looking at it. So to Zheng Banqiao from Dongting Lake. Zheng Banqiao, what rebuilds the sky from ground zero but a courtyard? From here, the yellow crane swings its mouth over the trees. Between fists of air, I grasp a blossom. Fruit has been waiting for my human hand. The sun always signals the day is falling over the mountains again. The fish in the Yangtze are passing through the shiplocks free, and heaven is silver, floating in the water you immortalized. Um, I'll read just a couple more poems from the middle of the book, the middle and the end. Um, in these sections, the speaker, as she has gone through this exercise of writing to poets, writing across centuries, is gaining agency over a language and thus gaining agency over a self or understanding a self and speaking about a self. Um, this poem is called The Construction of a Mechanical Crane. Um, it's set in Baoshan Steel City. The only thing you need to know is that it's, um, I think maybe 45 minute drive outside of Shanghai and it's the size of Rhode Island and it's the largest steel manufacturing company in the world. It's amazing, it's bright red. In a hangar in Baoshan Steel City, 20 miles northwest of Shanghai. A worker sleeps in a truck bed beside machines. To come here is to say I will look at light through simple trees, count the dust masks I have been given to see. 
Iron particles siphoned into ivy tunnels and the machines that cast the machine I know as crane. In the hangar, its torso, hollow, tree-sized, spins into a screw thread to form itself. In Shanghai, when the crane lifts a glass pane across the sky, this man dreams a room rises from a hole in the ground. I step inside it while another crane cuts through a cloud. Is my curiosity mechanical? Yes, my own body is a defeated animal. The next day I read, a red crown crane in captivity has lost half her beak. I return to the factory to wake the man from his dream. He prints a titanium replicate, attaches it to her injury. As I watch him, my own mouth stings. This poem is called Anfu Lu. Lu is a word for uh, street. Anfu Lu. Gray sky in particle matter. Press starlight back into stars. But color in trinkets, blue in the tarp, we walk beneath and listen to, breathing between double wide lanes. The public bus brought me here. A man with a bled eye searches for stain free t shirts. I sift through his cart alongside him for a white size, while in the galaxy, meteors drift across our backs. Bird of light pushing through fire, meet the earth in his slender hand. Breaking change, he returns home with something for dinner. This last poem um, is called Daffodils, and this is where the speaker is creating her own Shihua painting, so borrowing the image of a daffodil as a painting and then writing her own poem alongside it. Daffodils. You tell me your stalks are wooden and winter, bare. Tell me instead cranes will rest here. Tell me lettuce and field arrange heaven. Who says I cannot send you flowers? that your genus is chiffon and silk. Look, I look best with your flowers. Look at your flowers dying in my hair. Now look, I'm thanking you for my light. Thank you. Thanks so much, Jen. I really like how you described yourself as an illiterate writer <laughs> and thinking about how to how correspondence can also be a jumping point for thinking about translation. It's also occurring to me now that all three of our readers for tonight are like really amazing educators and teachers also, which is like now makes sense thinking about it and the way you are um, thinking about like language in such like open and innovative ways. Um, yeah, I also just wanna thank Molly again from BAM and Wendy Subway for making this all happen today. Um, if you stick around, we have books for sale um, upstairs right near the entrance. Um, and everyone's book is on sale um, if you want to check it out. I'm sure they'd be happy to sign them for you as well. Um, OK, without further ado, I want to introduce our last reader for tonight. Um, I'm pleased to introduce Sahar Muradi. Um, she just released her first gate, uh, chat book, which is called Gates from Black Lawrence Press. And it examines intimacy, time, and the unknown. Sahar is a writer, performer, and an educator born in Afghanistan and raised in the United States. She is the co-editor of One Story, 30 Stories, an anthology of contemporary Afghan-American literature, and the co-founder of the Afghan-American Artists and Writers Association. Please give a warm welcome to Sahar. Thanks. Oh, wow. Um, just total delight, like, wow. Thank you, Stephen, thank you, Jen. It's an honor and major panic to go after you. Um, yeah, thank you, um, Wendy Subway, Molly, Bam, and the workshop, Sophia, thanks for putting this all together. Sang Baka, Shauparak Charmi, Ham soya. Stone frog for turtle. Leather butterfly for bat. Shared shadow for neighbor. Those are some words in Dedi, which is my native language. And 
I love those words. I, um, I love that I've inherited this beautiful language, but I didn't always feel that way. Um, and it was really um, moving to hear each of your experiences um, coming into translingualism, which I love that. And I'm wearing my translingual earrings today. <laughs> um, I think my experience of my native language um, was one of ease. I was born into it. Then I came here when I was three and um, put into the public school system in Elmhurst, Queens, which, yeah, right on Elmhurst. But poo on Elmhurst for, you know, an environment of discouraging, um, or I guess just predominantly in the society, just, um, you know, being taught to feel ashamed of one's language and culture. And um, it wasn't until, and then there was a period of estrangement and alienation, answering back in English, um, first just sort of unconsciously, and then at some point sort of deliberately. And then in college, it was sort of a reawakening and uh, reclamation and adoration. That's when I discovered a lot of these compound words, for one, and began collecting and um, studying, learning, going back. I learned um, how to read and write and study through German, actually, which brought me a, a lot of shame because my teacher was German and had just spent a few months in Afghanistan, and I had to leap through two languages to learn my native language from her. But at that time, that's how I felt. Now I, I feel great gratitude for that. And I guess today it's in a space of maybe integration. Um, and I'll get to that later. I'm just going to start with, um, by not making this thing move, <laughs> I'm going to try to stand still. Um, I'm going to, I think I'll read along my own path with, my, with um, bilingual, translingual poetry. And I'll start with a few lines from Hafiz, 14th century poet from Iran, today Iran. خشتر ز عیش صحبت تا باغ و بهار چیست ساقی کجاست گو سباب انتظار چیست هر وقت خوش که دست دهد مختنم شمار کس را وقوف نیست که انجام کار چیست پیوند عمر بست به موی هوش دار غمخار خیش باش غم روزگار Cheest. And this is a translation, um, a co-translation with my father, Ali, and my mother, Shaima. What is better than pleasure, conversation, a garden, and spring? Where is the cupbearer? Tell me why are we waiting? Seize every joy that reaches your hand. What anyway is the end of all our efforts? Fathom, we are tied to life by a hair. Think twice. Be kind to yourself. What do the little griefs matter? So the ghazal goes on. Those are just a few couplets. But I began, um, I mean, I began with poetry much younger, in probably the sixth grade. And for me, it was a solace and refuge. Um, I was... Uh, I, I came into English as, as a new language, and um, and I just chose to observe. And um, I think a I came into poetry as a as a site of observation and witness. And um, so poetry, young, but sort of thinking of my and and poetry heard at home. You know, like my father would recite Hafiz and Rumi and Saudi, and I was quite jealous. <laughs> um, I, we have a practice, too, of actually consulting Hafiz, his divan, for, um, it's, a, it's a kind of bibliomancy. You pose a question to Hafiz, and you read a poem, and, his, and you interpret the poem as a response. So that was part of my childhood. Um, but I wrote in English, and that 
I guess was somewhat unconscious, but again, it wasn't encouraged for me to explore, neither by teachers or by my parents who were working all the time, who didn't know I was writing poetry. But in, in, um, when I went back to school, um, or when I went for my MFA, and I started to ex sort of mine, I like that expression, mine my um, language, I started with translation. But then I'm gonna jump, and these are not in the book, but um, I'm gonna jump to something that, um, so translation didn't satisfy me. I'm not um, entirely fluent, and it's something I will continue to explore, but, um, and I love that it's, a, it's become a family feat. Um, in fact, just earlier this week, I asked my mom for help with etymologies, and I trust her more than I trust Google. I also just trust her Google searches more than I trust my own. Um, so I, I'm looking forward to continuing with that. Um, but then I moved from translation, and, I, and I, there were a few translations I've done. Then I moved into sort of this um, generative translation. I, so I love, yeah, the, there's, in, there's incredible, um, poetry to the language, which is very similar to Farsi and Iran, but has its own sweetnesses. And um, so what, one of the things I really love are idioms. And, but I didn't want to simply translate the idioms, so I literally translated them, and then I retranslated and retranslated and tried to arrive at like a wildness. Because as you, you know, when you take a trans, uh, an idiom from one language and translate to another language, there is a wildness in it. And I wanted to, to see how much more wild it could get. And if maybe um, they could start speaking to each other. And so this is um, one of those. Between two hearts is a way. We met once, we were friends. We met again, brothers. Spring came not by one bloom, said, I am the year, and the trees, windless. I wished him open, his being fully flower, never his days. Begin at the river, born of a drop. A dog lapped the water clear. He said, half a faith being clean. Some words grow tails, you could watch them walk, a donkey passed us by. It wasn't ours to stop, nor the porcupine stroking its velvet child. Hunger was memory crisping. I starved to ask the fox, who is your alibi? Crooked and straight, half reach. I could swear he answered my tale. Two hands being sovereign. Between two brothers, our accounts should square. God said, eat and drink, said my brother. He did not say, glut. A piece of bread, an onion slice, a banquet. He opened his hand. These five are brothers, but not equals. The same donkey passed by us, wearing a new saddle. Um, I'm going to read a poem from the book now. Um, so this is uh, one that that, uh, in which three languages appear, English, Dari, and also Bambra, which is a language spoken in Mali. Um, sorry, give me one second. Okay. My, the, the titles don't, I mean, the poems don't have titles in the book, and now I realize that was a mistake. Okay. Um, <laughs> Um, and I spent a little time uh, for work in, in uh, Mali, and I was really struck by some of the um, commonalities in, in history and language and culture uh, between there and Afghanistan. And one of the things, you know, I guess on the sort of superficially both landlocked, both Muslim-majority countries, both struggling with um, extremism and uh, militancy, um, and there are secession movements in both, um, or border questions in both. Um, 
and their indigenous practices of Islam alongside um, tr um, more formal practices of Islam. Um, but also in Bambra, like Dadi, the greetings, they unfold forever. You, it takes you a day to say hello um, and goodbye. Um, and that sort of rubbing up against uh, war or against occupation, I, I, I thought about sort of the, the politenesses and the, you know, the kindnesses of a greeting and, the, and that sort of how that interacts with language, with the daily, um, sorry, not with language, but with, um, yeah, with, with war. Okay. Salam alaikum. Once when I was a girl, Inisa Goma, I believed in mourning like a hot yellow apple. Mondana Boshin, we never tired. Father said, God is good. Hede Sira, we slept in twos and threes. Famil Chaturast, it was a matter of everyone. Samogo Bedi, someone had work, someone didn't, someone always offered something. We were kids, but we knew everything. We belonged to everyone. E Sigina, after prayer, there was tea. After tea, there was fruit. Bifarmayin, mother taught us to draw our feet, to let others go first. Ani Tile, in time, day gave way to night. Jonathan Jorest, Someone would show up asking for my body, then another. E de goche kakene. We would exchange brothers who were not our brothers. Chodaya shukr. The earth met us in different ways. For some, it rained. For others, there wasn't water for the stones. A barika alaye. We thanked God for blessing us and not our neighbors. Khada Hafiz, history was the first to leave and without a trace. Ani Wula, father said the night has hands, mother reminded me of the apple. Shabbachayr, in the dark, I held nothing. The greetings play with the, the phrases that follow. So, um, like, Mondana Boshen literally means welcome, but it means, may you not be tired. That's how it's, I think, so, yeah, so beautiful. Okay. Um, so we never tired. Father said, God is good. Um, so thinking about tensions, thinking about language, and then my father got ill, and language no longer sufficed, and he really is a connection to my heritage, also my mother, but through him in particular. Um, so as he was declining and he passed, um, it really like tore me asunder and I think made me, yeah, I couldn't write for quite a while, but also I don't know how to access what I, felt only I could through him, but now I know, too, that there are other ways. Um, so this is for my dad. Father is on the tongue of the sewing machine. Above him, a plastic placemat, a fish, a pink one, a pinker, a black and white. Just going to lift you a little, Tom says, like we do every day. Typical fish his hands on his hips and heaves father's naked accent. Tom used to live in New York City, used to work in the market, used to stuff them with rocks so they'd weigh more, so the women would pay more. In the village, to be exact. Father's two stickers, two black glyphs, X's or T's, or what's that number just right and left of your bone hive? Two eyes on the plastic waterfall. The Israelis are dropping leaflets. Let's leave, Tom says, before. Father's a channel of peppercorns bisected by a green line on a skewer of time. 
Is Veselka still there? In a screen the size of a village, someone is lying still. Know what the safest street is? Third Street, know why? We couldn't get the picture, so we took NPR down Haver Hill right into the parking lot of St. Mary's, Fox at the waiting room. I heard waiting room, he heard fish scales, but we couldn't get the picture. Father asked me if I knew what it meant, Pishmerga. Tom lined him up exactly, X's and O's and oh, we had better go, for peace was dropping. Your father's a good man, they don't make any more. Fish eyes for when you cry. No, I didn't know. In the waiting room, father dubbed the glyphs. Pe, ya, sheen, meme, re, goth, he. Pish for early, mirga for death. Hell's angels, that's why. Um, so this, I, I gave a nerdy handout um, <laughs> that you can check out as I um, read this poem, also still on um, my father. It's Jahan, or John. He is not here, was here, was just here, was just a bloom of eyes darkening. I held some once, once a padar John. I had a one say, John a padar, once. Someone to some all. Jahan a padar, padar, Jahan. Um, and this also, so yeah, I think it's, um, I've been interested in, in writing, in sort of, I think, conveying how it is to live in multiple languages and sounds and, um, but also how, yeah, how they sort of hit up against each other. Um, Be Alif. Alif be stop, alif be reverse, be alif, repeat, be alif, be alif. Not be or to be, but be without, as in be khuda, without God, be pi, without footing, be alif. Lonely as a one, a flower, snapped, headless, footless. Without a lif, Be does not see, does not raise its arm to who is not here. A bowl that's lost its single grain, the pearl dropped from its mouth. Be a lif, not a, not Ali, his name mislettered, his name that is born of the cry of Ain, the wail of a slaughtered calf. Be a lif, without our alif, our first, our one, an alphabet made eyeless, pen starve, poem stutter, be, 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 baba, 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 be pai, be khada. So, um, be alif, this line of without alif, be does not see. I, you know, I thought it would be too trite to write alphabet poems, but I'm, I love the um, graphics of the Arabic alphabet, which is what um, Farsi or Dadi uses, plus four extra letters. Um, so the be is like, if you see on the paper, it's probably the font is too small but it looks as, uh, as if it's a bowl with a dot beneath it. Um, and standing alone, it would look so, but if, it's, if you add an A to it, then in, in, um, in Arabic and in Farsi, they, the letters connect, so the B reaches up and grabs the alif. So you'll see in Baba, you know, it changes shape. I have two more poems. Um, this is called Was She or Was She? And I've never read this aloud at a reading. Um, I 
think I only just finished it also, but um, aside from that, I think I am, um, yeah, it's, a, it's something I've been working on for a couple of years, and I think I've been moved to read it sort of in light of um, people finally taking seriously sexual assault and sexual harassment, um, and maybe, again, like, yeah, how can language um, be of use in situations like this. Was she? Was she? She was was she. I told her, you are like your motherland. A wilderness needs a belt. Laid down two white hotel towels. Took her into the shower to wuzu the boys out of her mouth. Pointed her nipples toward Qibla. Wiped clean her intention to perform ruku as if carrying a glass of chai on her back, fold at the knees, palms to the ground, slut rise, seated with your souls tucked under your astaghfirullah, used country. In my used country, I felt his teeth circle as a mosquito, the black mystery. He placed my right dist over my wrong stain, said he's bringing me home offered me a suite with a lock, a kili in the shape of a dwa, perhaps 22 years old, my body pure as a glass table, he wrote, yak du se, my teacher, on my back at night, came easy as a fly to post conflict, repeatedly used my country, called us washi, and licked his fingers. And I'll just close with this. Um, words by which to tell time. Sul, peace. A word that ends silently. A word whose sound you cannot hear. 38 years. Siu'ashed, not unlike. Siu'ashk. Thirty some tears. Bewa, widow, could be be without wa and, without and, without her and, her conjunction, the coincidence of two heavenly bodies at the same celestial longitude. Bewa, without her heavenly half. Two million bewa, two million halves in heaven. Sola, weapon, so near sul, the way a drone can call up monotony or an assassin, an air asset. Bomb, in English, a word that ends silently a word whose sound you cannot hear. In Dari, Pashto, Bomb, a word you hear clearly, loudly, a sound that detonates in your mouth. Thank you. Um, thanks a lot. I, I just wanted to end by saying, I wanted to say this before the poem, but I forgot. Um, but yeah, I think, so it's sort of my little journey here for the time being, I guess, is that I, especially in the last couple poems, um, thinking of, I think it's really a political act to write in Dedi at this time um, when the country in which I'm living is decimating the speakers of that language. Um, so that's where I am today. Thanks so much. I just wanted to make a quick announcement. I'm, I'm Gabe, I'm from Wendy's Subway. Uh, thank you so much, you all were so wonderful tonight. Um, before you leave, if you're interested in the books in, in the room, uh, there are catalogs that are free to take, so also information on the libraries, Alif Ba, which is a, um, a library in Beirut, um, libraries in Mexico City, 
uh, libraries in Philadelphia and LA. So if you're interested in these kinds of things, you you know can travel the world or travel the uh, country and find them everywhere. Um, and and there are more. There's more information about that there. Also, if you have questions for me about Wendy's, you can ask me. Thank you all for coming.